So I guess I can start. Is that a, do I get a nod? Thank you. Uh, greetings to everyone. First of all, a happy new year. Uh, it's good to see some faces on this screen, uh, some familiar faces, and thank you for joining us. This is the first um, uh, installment of the discussion group of the Athens Public International Law Center. Uh, we were expecting this year to start more auspiciously um, with uh, the possibility of uh, um, meeting everyone in person here and there in our usual conferences and uh, around the place. But for the moment, we're staying, we're remaining online. Uh, this has, of course, allowed us, is allowing us to see all of you uh, at the same time from wherever you are. So greetings to everyone. In uh, this inaugural discussion, we're very honored at the Athens Public International Law Center, uh, my colleagues and I, to have a very distinguished speaker, uh, distinguished scholar uh, and friend, Professor Dyre Tladi, who I will uh, introduce in a few moments. Let me just say at the outset that this session is being recorded for those who wish to know so, and it's also being streaming, streamed on uh, YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Dairi Tladi, who um, accepted to um, uh, inaugurate this, um, this series of discussions, is a professor of international law and holder of the Chair of Constitutional Law at the University of Pretoria. He is joining us from Summary, South Africa, if I can understand correctly. He is a member, of course, as you know, of the United Nations International Law Commission, and he is a special rapporteur on peremptory norms of in general international law. Professor Slade is also a member of the Institut de Droit International, he was formerly special advisor to the South African foreign minister and has also been legal advisor to the South African foreign ministry and legal counsel to the South African mission to the UN in New York. Uh, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, at its 67th session, the International Law Commission in 2015 decided to include use Coggins among its topics of uh, work and appointed uh, Professor Dairi Tladi as its special rapporteur. In the summer of 2019, the United Nations International Law Commission adopted a set, set of uh, 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 draft conclusions on peremptory norms of general international law. My understanding was that the title of the topic was changed, perhaps for reasons which uh, we might understand and which also might uh, be discussed. The draft is now, I think, is subject now to a second reading. And uh, this is what Professor Tladi will be discussing with us um, this evening. Before I give him the floor, let me also welcome uh, Ms. Maria Talalian, who is the legal advisor to the prime minister and former head of the legal department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who will be intervening with a short, as discussant, uh, with a short intervention right after um, uh, Professor Tladi's um, uh, speech this afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can um, join the discussion after we hear our speakers by uh, using the uh, chat, the questions at the chatbot function, excuse me, I'm getting it right, uh, my colleagues and the co-conveners of this discussion group will be gathering all your questions. You may also use the raise hand option if you want to uh, intervene or ask questions to our speakers. So without further ado, uh, let me welcome you all. Good to see you both. Let me thank Professor Tladi and turn to you, Diary, and give you the floor. Over to you and thank you very much for being with us. In the mute button. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that um, very uh, warm introduction. Um, I really am honored uh, to have been invited to deliver this inaugural lecture. 
Um, let me also just say thank you very much for using a picture of me when I was much younger. I think that picture was taken about 10 or 11 years ago. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I also should just say um, um, it's wonderful to see um, Maria Talalian here. Uh, an old friend um, and a wonderful collaborator from the past, from my past life. Um, and I look forward to hearing um, um, her comments. So I, I have been asked to speak for um, 30 minutes um, or so. So 30 minutes or so, I'll try to keep it under 30 minutes. And the idea being that afterwards we can have um, a very good conversation, a good discussion. Um, so if you'll allow me, I'll skip all the normal um, 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 and introductory um, uh, remarks and just jump right into the substance um, of this topic. Um, and um, um, as Professor Pazazzi said, uh, the topic of today is the second reading of the International Law Commission's draft conclusions on um, peremptory norms. Um, and as she also very helpfully explained, um, uh, in the summer of 2019, the commission adopted um, on first reading a full set of draft conclusions and peremptory norms of general international law. Um, and the hope is, uh, touch wood, that um, in August of 2022, the commission will adopt on second reading um, uh, and hopefully a final reading, um, a full set of draft conclusions. Um, I'm also thankful for that explanation about the, the process, the first reading, what first reading means. Um, and second reading. So that's really where we are. In um, By the th uh, June 2021, um, the commission had received uh, comments from states. Um, I studied those comments from states um, and I have prepared a uh, first report, which I'm hopeful will be on the website of the commission um, with a UN document number A slash CN4 slash 747. Uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, maybe in a month or so. Um, so this this text, which um, in which I basically assess, uh, evaluate the comments from states, uh, uh, criticisms, proposals, suggestions for amendments, um, and make recommendations to the commission, <clears throat> will form the basis of our deliberations. Um, in April of 2022, and on the basis of this, the Commission will then um, make any necessary amendments to the um, to the draft conclusions um, uh, adopted on first reading. And this is essentially what will be um, the first reading. So this rather long document, this um, uh, 90 page um, 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 the report, will form the basis of our debate, um, and it will also really then form the basis of my presentation today. So obviously. Um, I'm not going to be able to go through all of it um, in the half an hour that I have. So I'll just really try to touch on um, <clears throat> uh, what I think are the highlights. Uh, but before jumping into the second report, let me also perhaps it's useful just to give an, an overview of um, the draft conclusions that were adopted um, on first reading since the report in a sense, or at least the comments by states are a response to these draft conclusions and uh, the, um, to this report, which I have in front of me, uh, is a response to those comments. So it's useful just to give a, at least a broad overview of the, the report that was adopted um, on first reading. Also, I think that's useful just because I think it'll help you think of questions of any issues that I don't cover that might come in the report. So there may be an, um, a particular draft conclusion that I, I don't discuss in the context of the report, which, which uh, perhaps provokes a question from the audience. And so it's, uh, I think from that perspective, it's useful to sort of go through the, the full report. So the report itself, I'm sorry, the, um, the draft conclusions um, adopted on first reading consists of four parts. Um, the first part, which is titled Introduction, of course, uh, contains three draft conclusions. Uh, draft conclusion one uh, speaks about the scope of the draft conclusion, so I won't say anything else about that. Uh, draft conclusions two and three provide um, first the definition, and that's draft conclusion two. And then uh, draft conclusion three um, has something which is called the general nature of peremptory norms of general international law. Um, needless to say, uh, draft conclusion two, which... which um, which um, uh, is really based on um, Article 53 of the Vienna Convention with minor inconsequential modifications, uh, didn't raise many questions um, 
either within the commission or with, um, as far as states is concerned. So I won't say anything else about draft conclusion two. Uh, draft conclusion three, on the other hand, uh, which by the way, for me is, is, is the most important draft conclusion. Um, and yet it was also the draft conclusion that uh, caused the most controversy. As I said, it's titled um, The General Nature. And I'll just read it for you. Um, it, it provides uh, peremptory norms of general international law, um, reflect and protect fundamental values of the international community of states, um, uh, hierarchically superior to other rules of international law and are universally uh, applicable. Uh, this very simple and innocent provision has a, has a very long and difficult history, as I said. Um, I proposed a provision in, in, in my very first report in 2016, um, and very naively, I, I thought that this provision would be embraced by the Commission. Um, but surprisingly, it was uh, objected to uh, very strongly by, um, by a small group of members of the Commission, but still very vociferous. Uh, um, in fact, one new member of the commission who hadn't been on the commission when we first debated it um, said to me afterwards um, that, 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 that he was very surprised that the notion that use Kogans and peremptory norms reflected fundamental values were objected to so strongly. And he said that he thought, he always thought that um, the content of draft conclusion three um, was essentially international law 101. Um, but of course, nothing is ever quite that simple. Um, I'm an international commission. Um, and the remnant, so even though we were able to adopt draft conclusion three, um, the remnants of, of the disagreement and the very strong objection um, remain. If you, you open the draft conclusions and the commentary, um, you will find that in the very first paragraph of the commentary to draft conclusion three, there is a line that says, um, a view was expressed that such characteristics um, have an insufficient basis in international law and necessarily conflate the identification and effects of these norms and risk being viewed as additional criteria for determining whether or not a normal use Kogans exists. Um, um, in fact, if you read further, the very last paragraph, so in, uh, in effect, it sort of opens with the objection and it also closes with the objection because the very last paragraph of the commentary to draft conclusion three, uh, which is paragraph 16, um, also expresses um, um, the views of the, the objectors. And it says uh, something like a view was expressed that the, um, uh, sorry, a view was expressed in the commission that the difference between criteria and characteristics is obscure as is the proposition that such characteristics provide supplementary evidence. Um, so from this view, I, I, I guess one can say that the two main uh, reasons for the criticism against or the, the objection against draft conclusion three is that one, um, it's not supported by practice, um, and two, that um, um, it it confuses the uh, criteria by seemingly adding uh, a new criteria to the criteria that we've identified. Um, so at this point, I mean, I'll. Um, these comments were, were, there were certainly some states that uh, reiterated the same comments in their written comments. And so I'll address them a little bit more. Uh, so when I, I, I look at the comments of states, the only thing I'll say at this point is, is, is that um, I, I certainly don't think, and I made this point um, so within the commission, I don't think that these objections were in fact based on fact. Um, the second part of the draft conclusions, um, which perhaps contain what I think is the, the heart of the project, um, sets out the methodological rules for identifying norms of use Kogans for identifying peremptory norms. Um, the basic rule is contained in draft conclusion four, um, and it describes the criteria for identifying a norm of use Kogans. Um, these criteria that you find in draft conclusion four are derived from draft conclusion two or article 53. Um, I should though say, I mean, it has, been, uh, it has been pointed out to me that it seems as if this was just a cut and paste, but I should just say that, that if you look at article 53 and you look at uh, draft conclusion four, um, it, it, it doesn't go without saying that these had to be the criteria. In other words, these criteria were not mechanically just taken from um, Article 53. In fact, if you read the literature, you will find that um, there are many different ways in which these, these, um, 
um, these criteria have been put forward, or there are many different criteria that have been put forward, also apparently based on Article 53 of the Vienna Convention. So, um, so I think there was a lot of thought that went into these um, 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 so these criteria. The, the, the one interesting thing is that um, states, and I think members of the Commission in general, uh, generally accepted these um, these um, um, these criteria. So the first criteria uh, or the first criterion in draft conclusion four is that the norm in question must be a norm of general international law. In other words, even before you start thinking about whether or not that norm is a norm of um, use Kogan's, um, one has to be satisfied and to satisfy others that the norm in question is a norm of general international law uh, and not particular international law. Um, the second criteria, which I guess is the sort of heart, um, so the heart of the requirements is that this norm must be um, accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole as a norm from which no derogation is permitted. So in simple ter terms, um, this criterion is that there must be a belief by states as a whole that the norm is in fact used Kogan's. Um, so in very much the same way um, um, that opinion juris and custom international law is a belief uh, on the part of states that that particular norm is a rule of international law. So opinion juris congentis is a, a um, uh, a belief on the part of states that the norm is a norm of use Kogan's. Uh, the rest of the draft conclusions in part two are really directed at sort of uh, teasing out the details from these two criteria. Um, so I won't go through all of them. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, so if you take the very next draft conclusion to draft conclusion five, um, which I think is currently titled bases of, yeah, I think it's, I think it's currently titled bases of, um, um, the basis of peremptory norms of general international law. Um, it tells us what we mean by the first criteria. So what do we mean when we say a norm is a norm of general international law? Um, it identifies in the very first paragraph, custom international law as the most common basis for peremptory norms. And by the way, for some reason, um, uh, one of the things that attracted most attention in, in respect of this draft conclusion was the use of the word bases and bases. Um, I don't think it's a particularly important thing. So I, I have actually made a suggestion that we, so we simply revert to sources, which is what many of the states had suggested. Um, interestingly, with respect to treaties and general principles of law, well, I shouldn't say interestingly, I mean, I, I think it's a I think it's a decent choice made by the commission. Um, the draft conclusion adopts a, a more ambivalent approach um, in that it states that um, they, meaning treaties and general principles of law, may also serve as bases, or now hopefully sources of peremptory norms or for peremptory norms. Yeah? Um, so this hesitant language uh, suggests that, well, it's not impossible for provisions of a treaty or a general principle of law to form the basis of a peremptory norm, but this is not common. Um, and one might even go as far as to say, well, there is no practice to support this. And I think this is the, the essence um, of, um, of the second paragraph of draft conclusion five. Um, another example um, is draft conclusion seven, um, which addresses uh, part of the second element. And it tells us what we mean by the phrase, the international community of states. And I thought I should mention this one because um, this was a draft conclusion in the second part that did, in fact, attract quite a lot of attention. So draft conclusion uh, seven uh, makes it plain that it is the acceptance and recognition of states and not that of other actors that is relevant for the determination of whether a norm is a peremptory norm of international law. Um, and then it further qualifies this by saying that it is the acceptance and rec or the recognition and acceptance, acceptance and recognition um, of a very large majority of states. So in a sense um, that while a simple majority is insufficient, um, it's not required that um, it's not required that um, all states accept and recognize um, the peremptory status of a of a norm of use Kogan's. Um, then finally, draft conclusions eight and nine describe um, the materials that uh, may serve as evidence for establishing this acceptance and recognition. So how do you go about showing that? The international community of states as a whole uh, recognize a norm of use Kogan's. What is the kind of evidence that you may put forward? Um, the next part, part three uh, of the set of draft conclusions, is the longest part. 
Um, and it's also quite important, I guess. Um, and it contains 12 draft conclusions. Um, um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's quite important. I, I don't think this part is particularly controversial, largely because just about every, well, I mean, almost everything in this part can be um, uh, said to have been based on an instrument that already exists and an instrument that is generally accepted. So for that reason, uh, one, there weren't too many comments either by states or by um, by um, by members of the commission, but I'll just sort of describe it very quickly. So draft conclusions 10 to 13 uh, address consequences of use Kogan's uh, for treaties, including um, the rules that are articulated in articles 54 and 64 of the Vienna Convention, so rules relating to the invalidity of treaties that are in conflict with use Kogan's. Um, this main rule or these main rules, I guess, because there's two rules, but so this main rule of um, invalidity is then applied to other sources of obligations. Uh, so, so, so this main rule of um, of invalidity is applied to custom international law. It's applied to unilateral acts of states um, and decisions um, and resolutions of international organizations. Uh, I'll, I'll just pause here, maybe, to say that that um, in the context of 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 uh, this part, I think the main normative issue that arose both within the commission and from the comments by states um, concerned whether UN Security Council decisions or resolutions ought to be covered by draft conclusion 16. And if so, whether this should be explicitly mentioned in the draft, conclu uh, in the draft conclusion itself. Um, so myself, obviously I had proposed that it should be covered. Um, but the compromise that was reached within the commission was that we should not explicitly refer to the UN Security Council in the text of the draft conclusions, but that we should do so um, in the commentaries. Um, and by the way, even in the commentaries, um, those that 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 had difficulty with uh, this uh, did push back a little bit. Um, um, I looked through the commentaries. I was actually pleasantly surprised to find that we didn't include um, in the commentaries um, um, any language um, expressing dissenting of views like the language that we had um, in in um, in draft conclusion three. I think I know why, but but I, I was um, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, so when I looked through the the commentaries, um, um, so just a couple of days ago, uh, the draft conclusion 17, 18, and nineteen address what might be referred to um, as um, the state responsibility related consequences uh, of use Kogan's. Uh, so draft conclusion 17 describes this general relationship um, that has been written about uh, a lot um, between use Kogan's and Erga Omnis obligations. Um, so there's nothing spectacular there. Um, in fact, I, I think I have at least been told that it leaves many questions, or at least it leaves an important question unanswered, I've been told, but in any event. Um, um, so, but there's nothing spectacular there, and there weren't a lot of criticism either from the commission or, or from states. Uh, draft conclusion 18 um, describes the rule that is contained in the Articles of State Responsibility that grounds uh, for precluding wrongfulness cannot be invoked in respect of alleged breaches of use Kogan's. Um, and then draft conclusion 19 sets forth um, the duty on states to uh, cooperate to bring to an end situations arising from breaches of use Kogan's, uh, not to recognize such situations and to assist Oh, sorry, not to assist in the maintenance of such situations. So again, uh, these are provisions that um, that are taken um, uh, largely verbatim. In fact, I think verbatim um, from the Articles of State Responsibility. So, so not many issues were raised as far as um, 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 those particular provisions. The last two draft conclusions in Part Three are sort of generally applicable uh, to consequences and maybe even beyond. Um, the consequences. Um, the first of these flows from uh, the principle of systemic integration in Article 31.3c of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, and, and it basically just provides that as far as possible, other rules of international law should be interpreted in such a way as to render them consistent with use Kogan's, using, of course, more eloquent language and more carefully considered language. Um, um, this interpretative rule was not very controversial at all. Um, however, the other draft conclusion, uh, draft conclusion 21, uh, did attract many negative comments, uh, both from members of the commission that generally supported everything that the commission, that the special rapporteur proposed, um, and members of the commission that didn't like much of what the special rapporteur proposed. Uh, and the same pattern is also seen with states. So both mem um, states 
that are generally happy with the draft conclusions um, and those members that are generally unhappy or rather those states that are generally unhappy with the draft conclusions did have difficulty with draft conclusion 21. Um, so it attracted uh, it attracted a lot of uh, negative um, uh, comments. Um, it sets forth a procedure for resolving disputes involving use Kogan. So one state says there's a uh, this particular treaty uh, is in a violation of use Kogan, so therefore the treaty is is invalid. What do you then do, right? So what kind of a uh, uh, procedure? In 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 brief, I mean, it's based on uh, the dispute settlement provision mechanisms framework of the Vienna Convention, and and it puts uh, it put forward a, a couple of steps. So the first step is uh, the parties to the dispute should attempt to resolve the dispute through normal, you know, the normal amicable means, uh, <clears throat> negotiation, uh, um, conciliation, etc., etc., etc. The second is, and this is really the crux of it. Um, is in the event that there is, um, by the way, I should say that I think that the language that the, um, so the commission chose for the second part is, uh, is I think extremely good. Um, I mean, I didn't come up with it, but I think it's extremely good language. Um, really that in the event that there is no solution, um, the party that is alleging that there is a breach um, may only carry out whatever measures it had proposed initially if the other party to the dispute um, does not offer to submit the matter to um, um, the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. So essentially what it does is it really encourages um, um, submission of the dispute to the International Court of Justice in the event that there, that there is no amicable solution. Um, I mean, I'll describe the problems associated with this draft conclusions when I, 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 I speak about the comments from states. Um, I will say though, um, even at this early stage, that one, I, I certainly understand the criticisms, um, um, and I certainly understand uh, the problems that arise with this provision. Um, at the same time, I, I, I do not see that the Commission can have a set of draft conclusions on this topic without a provision like this. So, um, so in effect, the the um, uh, the um, the challenge for me was to try to come up with. Um, you know, in this fifth report was to try to come up with ways in which to at least try to address, um, you know, even if not fully, try to address as much as possible the concerns um, that had been raised. Um, I'll just jump real quickly to part four, which is titled General Provisions. Um, it contains only two draft conclusions. Uh, draft conclusion 22 simply, simply states, whenever you hear somebody saying simply, simply um, you know, red flags should come up, but it simply states, that the draft conclusions are without prejudice to consequences that that um, uh, specific peremptory norms uh, might otherwise have. Uh, um, so this provision um, seems rather innocent and incontroversial, but um, you know, as I've said in a publication um, like Still Waters, it has a rather tumultuous origin. Uh, this provision comes from um, the famous and controversial debate concerning the relationship between use Kogans um, and immunities. Uh, but the provision itself is, I think, unproblematic and generally accepted. I quite like the provision, and I think, um, uh, uh, yeah, and it didn't receive many, um, um, so many criticisms. It's just the history of the provision that itself is very controversial, but I think the provision itself is is fairly okay, and, and, it, and that includes the commentary to it. Uh, draft conclusion 23 is different. Um, it sets forth a non-exhaustive list of use Kogans, which uh, was previously identified um, by the commission. Um, so I'll now just, so I'll just turn now to, to what I think is the juicy bits. Um, and that's the criticism that the draft conclusions have received from states. Um, I, I want to begin with, uh, you know, and this is a, a rather sensitive issue. So whenever I, I, I address this issue, I become rather emotional. Um, so be careful if you're going to ask me a question about this. Um, there, there was a general criticism by a few states, but some states, of course, you know, like some members of the commission, you know, might be a few, but they have such loud voices that it's hard to ignore them. Um, and, and the argument or the proposition was that in general, um, the work of the commission on this topic um, you know, and sometimes this was personalized, the work of the special rapporteur on this topic um, was not based on any practice. Um, it was a view that was expressed most vociferously by, um, 
you know, a couple of states of the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, um, uh, Israel. Um, the Netherlands seems to be suggesting that, but at places not. Um, um, I mean, I have to emphasize that that this view was held by by a very small number of states. Uh, nonetheless, because I think it's potentially very harmful. Um, in the fifth report, I spent quite a lot of pages, a lot of paragraphs addressing it. Um, what I will do, if you indulge me, um, so because I'm not going to go through all of it, I'll just quote the last bit, the last paragraph, um, it, uh, in which I address this particular uh, comment. Um, and and there I say. Also, I apologize for the use of the third person voice, which is very strange as UN reports. But anyway, I say, while the special rapporteur believes that the work on this topic is in fact supported by state practice, he would like to stress that he finds it curious that reliance on the jurisprudence of international courts, including the International Court of Justice, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, is regarded by a few vociferous states with such disdain. He would point out that one of, if not the most successful topics addressed by the commission since the adoption of the 1966 articles, that would be the 2001 articles on state responsibility, relied significantly on the jurisprudence of international courts and tribunals. Indeed, the foundational principle in that set of articles, namely article one, relies wholly on international jurisprudence and scholarly writings. Ditto for article two, this is also true of the topics adopted by the Commission over the course of the current quinquennium. For example, the basic rule in the conclusions on identification of customer international law, conclusion two, which puts forward the two constituent elements, includes in the commentaries there to only decisions of international courts. Similarly, the commentaries and, um, on conclusion five do not refer to any state practice. The same is true of the commission's conclusions on subsequent practice and subsequent agreements in relation to treaty interpretation. For the special rapporteur, this is not a criticism of those works of the commission. Quite the contrary, it is a recognition of the fact that judgments of the international courts, in particular the International Court of Justice, are seen as authoritative. Now, if you are able to read between the lines, the young ones would say if you would be able to low key um, see a suggestion that there is some double standards there. Um, as far as that particular criticism is concerned, and that's probably why I, I, I react so um, uh, so negatively to that particular criticism. Um, that criticism um, concerning the lack of state practice uh, was also particularly evident with respect to the comments on draft conclusion three, as I mentioned before. Um, yet, if you if you take a look at if you do an honest assessment of draft conclusion three and the commentaries there too, you'll find that the characteristics that are identified in, in draft conclusion three are three strong support, um, you know, in the form of statements by states and judicial decisions and so on. Um, so again, I should emphasize that it's really only a small minority of, uh, um, of members of the commission um, and states um, that, that suggested the draft conclusion three was not based on practice, um, while in fact the variety of states and I'll also just including Greece, not only expressed support for the draft conclusions, but some even suggested that, um, that the commission should consider uh, working these general characteristics or general nature into the criteria for the identification. Uh, um, so in the end, having considered all of this, I, I thought it would be inappropriate to suggest any textual changes to draft conclusion three, uh, but if there are any changes to be made, these perhaps could be made to the commentaries to show more clearly um, the relationship between the criteria and the characteristics I and mean, also the limits to each uh, Another draft conclusion that attracted um, uh, significant and interesting comments was draft conclusion seven concerning the meaning of international community of states as a whole. Um, I think about just about all states um, accepted the emphasis on, on, on states as appropriate. The big question was whether the standard of a very large majority was appropriate. Uh, there were some states, uh, Russia, Israel, the United States, and others, um, that felt that the appropriate standard ought to be universal acceptance, or at the very least, near universal acceptance, or virtual, um, 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 so virt virtually uniform, or virtually universal, I think. Um, so was the phrase. Um, uh, the point that I make in this report, of course, is that it's very interesting that the very same states that that make this argument are the very same states that um, that have insisted on you know more practice and yet in the comments at least I haven't been able to find any prep um, so any practice that requires that 
um, acceptance and recognition for use Kogans should be universal or virtually universal. Um, the point of emphasis, and this is actually in the commentary already, but it's perhaps a point that can be emphasized even more uh, in the commentary is that the assessment to be made is not a purely mathematical, mechanical, or statistical exercise. Um, it should be, it ought to be a qualitative exercise that takes into account a host of number of um, different factors, right? And so just, uh, I mean, so just not the numbers. So, so, if you, so if you take that uh, point that it's not just a mechanical, um, there's a qualitative assessment to be made, um, it really makes this question about numbers, about majority, uh, uh, um, a large majority, um, and so on, uh, a really insignificant question, I think. Uh, the real question becomes how this, this qualitative assessment is to be undertaken, and I don't think that's something that can be clarified in draft conclusions. I think maybe the commentary, of course. Um, I, I see that we're I've gone a bit over time, so I'm going to jump right um, and say a few words about draft conclusion 21 and draft conclusion 23, because I think um, these are the two draft conclusions that received uh, the most number of comments um, and received criticisms from, from all the different angles. Um, at the, so I start with draft conclusion 21, and um, you know, at the risk of gross oversimplification, I would say there were two general criticisms um, of uh, draft conclusion 21. So first of all, there was a view that's expressed by several states that draft conclusion 21 just simply didn't respect, did not reflect positive law, did not reflect practice. Um, um, so these states, of course, acknowledged that it was based on the Vienna Convention, um, uh, but they recall that not all states were party to the Vienna Convention, and that in fact some states that were party to the Vienna Convention had entered reservations to draft conclusion 21. Um, so in a sense, the argument. Um, then was that um, draft conclusion 21 seems to be imposing um, the Vienna rules, which are not binding on everyone on um, all states. So that's the, the one um, uh, so the one argument that that uh, it's an imposition of the Vienna model through the back door. Um, second, um, so the second criticism and from exactly the opposite end of the spectrum, is that draft conclusion 21 was not fully consistent with the Vienna model. Um, and because of that, it risked undermining the Vienna procedures by creating the impression that those procedures were not binding. So that's on the one side, uh, draft conclusion 21 goes too far. And on the other side, uh, it doesn't go far enough. Um, as with most things, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, and the middle in this case is that the provision does not go too far since it does not actually create any obligations. Um, but I also think it doesn't undermine the Vienna procedure since it makes it very clear that these procedures that are contained in the draft conclusions are without prejudice to existing rules on dispute settlement. Um, I think that these are things that could be made clearer. It could be made clearer in the text and it could be made clearer in, um, in um, the commentaries. I've already made some suggestions in the text about how we could make that even clearer than it already is. Um, and from next week, I'll be working on the commentaries to try to see um, how we can make that clearer. Um, I now turn to perhaps the sexiest part of the draft conclusions, um, and that is the non-exhaustive list um, that is annexed to the draft conclusions. Uh, this is also another provision that has come under severe criticism, um, and again, with good reason. Um, um, I, I recall that in the debate, one member of the commission uh, looking at the list, I mean, was looking at the list that I had proposed, but it's pretty much the same list, uh, remarked that he had the impression that the commission was stuck in the 1960s. So essentially, the argument from this members and others is that these norms, uh, that there are norms uh, modern norms that ought to be included um, that perhaps haven't been included uh, so in the list that we need to sort of catch up with the times, so to speak. Um, the other side of the argument, uh, again, from exactly the opposite uh, end of the line. The commission did not do a good job of yeah, So in other words, the commission okay. sets forth. Yeah, uh, is that better? Yeah, you froze for a moment, but okay, we, we okay. hear you again now. Okay. Okay, very good. So the argument, 
is that the commission put forward um, this methodology, this very good methodology in part two, and then it comes up with um, uh, it comes up with um, uh, a list of norms, but it doesn't apply its own methodology, right? Um, uh, so that's also a criticism. Um, again, I think the answer to both criticisms, I think, so I haven't made any proposals for change here. Um, I think the answer to both criticism lies in the carefully chosen language um, in draft conclusion 23, um, that this is a list of norms that the international commission, that the international law commission has previously referred to as having that status. That I think is the answer to that question. I think it's important to retain this provision and I think, uh, and I also don't think it's necessary to make, um, to make um, so any modifications, if, if this carefully chosen language that all that the commission is doing here is to say, here are norms that we as a commission have previously said are use Hogan's. Uh, there's just one point I want to make clear and, I, and I'll close off on this point is that it's not, I've seen in some literature, uh, some have suggested um, that the import of this language that I've just quoted is that the commission is itself not making a claim that these norms are used Kogans. I don't think that's correct. That's not the import of that language. The only import of that language from my perspective is that the commission is limiting itself to norms that it previously has identified as norms of use Kogans. Um, so these are my brief comments on the views that have been expressed by states. Um, I think I'm going to have a rough ride in April. Um, and so hopefully this will be practice for that rough ride. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tladi. Thank you, yes. Uh, we'll see how it goes, but uh, this panorama of how the work is standing up to now is very uh, interesting. And again, I think, very helpful for uh, a discussion. Let me just immediately turn to, since our time is passing, immediately turn to uh, Maria Telalian um, um, to give her first uh, reactions to um, um, the, um, the, re the second reading as, as suggested and as presented by Professor Cladi. I have to say that uh, Ms. Telalian was um, um, in the sixth committee and also commented on the first draft, I think, at the time. So Maria, uh, over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you, Faye, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to in this uh, very interesting discussion with uh, Professor Dari Tladi. An old friend, as I said, and colleague in the Sixth Committee. Uh, we have worked together for many years on different and uh, I might say very controversial issues of international law. Uh, Daria, I wish to congratulate you once again for uh, your outstanding contribution and uh, very hard work in uh, drafting the four uh, high quality reports, I would say, that you submitted to the International Law Commission and. Uh, which formed the basis for the elaboration of the content of these draft conclusions and uh, their accompanying commentaries. A task uh, which, as we all understand, uh, was a very demanding and a very difficult one, given the complexities and the sensitivities involved in this topic. Now, um, I thank you also for this very informative and uh, comprehensive presentation today. Um, you actually highlighted not only the negotiating history of some. Can you hear me? Hello? There is an intervention. I don't understand why. Yes? Hello? We muted yeah. it. Go ahead. Okay. Um, you didn't simply highlight the negotiating history of some of the most important draft articles. Uh, conclusions actually adopted uh, by the ILC on first reading in 2019, but also uh, the issues that have attracted most criticism, both in the ILC and also in the Sixth Committee. Now, uh, I would like to take this opportunity and to make some observations, uh, put some questions to you on some of these issues. Um, 
Also, in light of uh, the recent comments sent by states to the Secretary General of the United Nations on this issue, uh, first, um, I'm glad that you raised the issue of uh, methodology. Um, and there are serious concerns uh, that some states uh, have raised, uh, both uh, during the discussion in the Sixth Committee uh, and uh, in the International Commission um, on these questions. Uh, actually, um, I, I recall that uh, there was an argument uh, which you raised yourself that there is insufficient state practice uh, by the committee uh, when uh, considering this topic, that uh, reliance uh, on a theory and doctrinal opinion rather than on state practice uh, uh, was made. Uh, of course, I recall all your explanations uh, during the relevant debates, and more specifically that state practice in the form of uh, either national uh, judicial decisions, statements by states, treaty practice, resolution of the GA have been provided in uh, the relevant reports that you have elaborated uh, in this respect. However, what uh, worries me now is that uh, these uh, same concerns uh, are still reflected in the recent observations uh, that I mentioned earlier. And there is also a call for a more uh, detailed elaboration on specific examples of uh, state practice where appropriate. Um, I just wonder if you could uh, tell us uh, what should be done, because I think this is uh, um, a very serious uh, problem and uh, of course my country does not share these concerns because we still believe that there is ample state practice uh, around these issues. Uh, turning now to draft conclusion three, uh, you mentioned uh, that this is a very important uh, conclusion and I agree with you, actually, we have uh, commended uh, you and the ILC for having drafted it. Um, and the three important uh, characteristics for the identification of a use cogens norm. However, as you yourself uh, mentioned earlier, there are so many um, divergent opinions regarding these uh, characteristics, uh, different views and uh, Actually, these um, objections um, concern mostly the phrase uh, uh, reflect and protect the fundamental values of the international community as a whole. Um, most, most specifically, some states consider that this uh, element is a new one, as you mentioned, and goes beyond the definition of Juskogian's norm in draft conclusion uh, two. And they also say that it creates confusion with the criteria regarding the identification of uh, a norm as use cogens uh, as um, contained in uh, uh, draft uh, conclusion number four. Um, I wonder how these problems can be addressed now by the commission uh, and uh, whether, I mean, this is just a thought, a personal uh, thought. I wonder whether um, one could merge uh, draft conclusion two with draft conclusion three in order to avoid uh, duplication and make it more clear that this is not about criteria, but it's about uh, uh, the characteristics of these uh, um, norms. Um, another issue that um, has to be settled and you mentioned, of course, is the concern about uh, draft conclusion five, uh, which uh, spells out clearly that treaty provisions and general uh, principles of law may also serve as basis for peremptory norms. Uh, in the comments of some states, um, it is emphasized that treaty provisions would serve as basis for use against norms uh, only if and when uh, uh, they reflect a codification of customary international law. I think this is obvious and could be further explained in the commentary to this uh, draft conclusion on elsewhere. Um, however, as regards the uh, general principles of law, 
uh, it is mentioned by these states that uh, it uh, that may, they may influence the formation of international customary uh, law, but cannot be considered a basis for it. Uh, personally, uh, I think uh, the draft uh, conclusion as it stands is a very um, acceptable one, and I wouldn't change any wording of it. But I want to see how you, um, your, what is your thinking, um, and if there is room for improvement uh, with respect to this particular uh, draft conclusion. Now, you mentioned also uh, the, the revergent views that exist as regards draft conclusion seven, paragraph two. Uh, where the Commission, in order to explain um, acceptance and recognition by the international uh, community of states as a whole, uh, uses the term uh, by a very large majority of states. Um, I'm afraid that there are still um, objections to the expression by a large majority of states. and. Uh, uh, there are states uh, who suggest uh, to follow uh, the same uh, um, the same standards uh, that have been uh, established for customer international law uh, rules, and um, some of them even refer to the case law of the ICJ in the North Sea continental shelf, uh, uh, where. Um, these standards were uh, well accepted. Um, I want to ask you uh, to elaborate a little bit on this question and whether you think there is a way out uh, or whether uh, this uh, phrase could be actually interpreted in line with uh, the respective jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice uh, as meaning an overwhelming majority. This actually has been proposed by some states and I wonder if this could be a way out. Uh, of course, another issue of contention is uh, draft uh, conclusion 16 to which you made reference earlier. And um, you presented it as a compromise, the fact that there is a reference only in the commentary to Security Council resolutions. Um, uh, when I presented uh, the comments of Greece uh, in the Sixth Committee, I all, also mentioned that um, Greece wouldn't like uh, to single out Security Council resolutions taken under Chapter 7 of uh, the Charter, uh, given that these resolutions um, are consistent with uh, Euskogen's norms and there is no practice to the contrary. Um, now, reading the new comments sent by states, I uh, see that some of them have underlined that uh, this uh, reference, even in the commentary, would seriously undermine the work uh, of this body, uh, which, as we know, bears uh, primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and uh, security. Now, a divergence of opinion also exists um, on draft uh, conclusion 21 uh, that uh, you very eloquently presented earlier. Uh, of course, these procedural requirements uh, that um, are introduced uh, in this um, conclusion for the invocation of the invalidity or termination of a rule of customary of the international law by reason of being in conflict with uh, Euskogen's norm is taken from the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties. However, many states uh, feel um, that there is no need to include this uh, the, in the present uh, draft uh, conclusions, such a mechanism, since uh, these conclusions are of a uh, recommendatory in nature. Uh, I myself have made some comments comments uh, about uh, this question in our uh, national uh, comments. And I believe that, um, although I, I know that you are very much attached to this uh, process, uh, this might create some difficulties and might create uh, a strange precedent. Um, now, lastly, on the question of the sexiest, as you called, uh, 
conclusion, which is the illustrative uh, list of his Kogan's norms uh, that the ILC has elaborated and which is annexed to the draft conclusions. Um, of course, um, you explained very eloquently all the difficulties involved. Um, and I know, of course, that the aim of drafting uh, such a list should not be seen as an attempt to address uh, the content of uh, individual peremptory norms, as you, you said, you yourself has said on many occasions, but uh, rather to list in a non-exhaustive way norms uh, which previously, as you said, uh, were identified by the Commission. However, there are still uh, many views, uh, different views as regards uh, the added value of this list. And uh, um, I would add to what you said earlier that some states uh, fear that no matter how many caveats are used here, the inclusion of such a list might lead to the wrong impression uh, that the norms listed are uh, exhaustive and uh, this might impede the evolution of use Corgan's norms uh, in the future. Uh, now, having said this, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but uh, I think that the Commission uh, and you yourself uh, has a lot of work to do, <laughs> but I believe that um, there, is, there is room of uh, improvement. Uh, I think if one reads carefully the comments and observations uh, made by states, especially the last uh, observations of 2019 to the Secretary General, um, there is a very positive attitude towards uh, the entire set of articles. And I believe with uh, some uh, language, new language or some uh, further clarifications in the commentaries, uh, things could uh, really be improved, uh, in particular, as regards this um, um, contested, I would say, uh, issues, which are very few in my view. Uh, well, uh, sorry if I took uh, more than uh, uh, more time that it was allocated to me, but I think uh, uh, Dare should uh, elaborate more on these questions in order to clarify better the picture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Maria, Ms. De La Lian. Um, it's interesting to have, uh, you know, this uh, back and forth between a member of the commission, I mean, their special rapporteur on the topic, and then someone who also had the chance to uh, comment it on, on the, uh, from a state aspect. Uh, so your remarks were very uh, interesting. I'm sure Tlade uh, Dairate will uh, return. Uh, before I, I mean, handing over the floor to uh, Professor Tlade, I would like to ask if there are some, um, any more initial uh, comments or reactions. I see that Professor Sicilianos has joined us and it's good to have you, uh, Alexander, with us. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether uh, you would like to uh, take the floor uh, since you just joined us a little later and I think you have to leave earlier. Well, but, thank um, you, thank you so much, you. Uh, uh, Faye. And uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, warmly uh, Professor Tladi for his excellent presentation and uh, for the work done there. It is really a tremendous work. Uh, my question would be very simple following uh, uh, Mrs. Telayan's comments. Uh, what is the added value of um, this the project, this draft? And uh, more precisely, uh, where do you locate uh, the progressive development of international law? Uh, in which provisions uh, do you uh, think that um, uh, we can speak about uh, progressive development rather than codification? Um, this, this is my, my, my simple question. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Alexander. Uh, so I think, uh, Diary, I will turn over to you because there have been a few comments, you know, and reaction and first questions made while all of the rest of us are warming up to um, perhaps add some more to those. So over to you. Um, I'll start with the uh, uh, last 
questions uh, because I haven't written them down. So otherwise I'll forget. Uh, so what's the added value? I mean, I think the added value is that this project is intended to, uh, to um, as a commentary say, to help those that may be called upon to identify norms of use Kogans to do so in a, uh, uh, um, um, a systematic way. Um, so at the moment you've got courts and tribunals um, um, and different actors um, in different places um, deciding without a, a generally accepted methodology that something is or isn't used Corgans. And what this is project is intended to do for me is to sort of say, um, so if use Corgans is going to be um, um, a useful concept in international law, I think there has to be an acceptable, um, a generally accepted methodology for saying, uh, this or that norm is a norm of use Corgans, um, and also here here are the consequences for use Corgans. And so that's really, I think, that the added value is to um, it's not to create any new law, it's not to come up with any new theories, it's not to resolve any age old debates. Um, it's just simply to say, here's a text that you can use if you want to apply use Corgans, if you need to apply use Corgans, um, because I think there isn't anything like that. And it's also presented in a way that I think is, um, is accessible. Um, it's presented in a way that does not require that you have studied Hugo de Groot and you have read all the International Court of, right? It's, um, um, so the idea is to really make it accessible um, that even a, um, High Court judge in Mafikeng will be able to say an argument has been presented to me on use Kogans. I have a, um, um, an easily accessible text that's going to help me identify that this or that norm is use Kogans. So I think that's the, the real added value. Um, I, for me, um, the text that we have presented is in large parts codification. Um, <clears throat> we are having this this ongoing debate within the commission about what is codification, what's progressive development. I think if you could make an argument that something is progressive development, and even this, I'm not quite sure it's progressive development, but you might say, well, draft conclusion 21 uh, does not reflect law. And so, right. And so perhaps that's, that, that would be the text that's progressive development. But I think by and large, um, at least my, uh, my intentions, I mean, putting forward um, the proposals that I put forward, um, was to reflect the law as it stands. And so in a sense, this text is, is you know, um, um, I mean, this fifth report, I describe it as a, um, uh, an American style um, uh, restatement of laws, right? So it's a, it's a so that would be um, <clears throat> uh, my response to the questions by Professor Silianos. Um, uh, um, so um, on the question of methodology, I mean, I think it is true that, there are a lot of states and I mean, there may be few, but um, these criticisms can't be ignored, as I said, precisely because uh, it can be so harmful, this criticism that that the work is not based on um, among state practice. Um, I guess my response, so my flippant response, I'll give a more serious response afterwards, but my flippant response would be um, that I find a lot of these comments to be based on narrative. Um, you would know, um, so one of the, the ongoing debates within uh, the Sixth Committee um, is that we need to have a, a, um, a, a more open communication between the Sixth Committee and the International Law Commission. I can't remember what the word is. There's a word that we like to use about how, how we need to communicate um, um, so better this dialogue. Uh, but I find it interesting that, so a dialogue can't be that we're speaking past each other. Um, so as you said, in previous reports, I have said, I think draft conclusion 20, I'm sorry, I think draft conclusion three is based on practice. Here's a practice. Look at this footnote. Here's what it lists. Tell me why it's not practice. So for me, it's very difficult when I now receive uh, um, um, comments by states and it's, oh, this is not based on practice. But there hasn't been a response to what was in the earlier reports. So, so um, um that then becomes very difficult to have the kind of dialogue that I think we're so we're speaking about. I have to confess, though, that said, um, that um, the the I th now I have to be careful. I th it was um, it was the either the comments by the United States or by Israel. I think um, did in fact respond a little bit. So if you look at the written comments of either Israel or the United States, there was at least some response as to why they don't view this material as practice. And so if that's the case, then we have a very different understanding of what practice is. 
so judicial decisions by national courts aren't practiced apparently. Um, and yet in our, in our, uh, in our work on, uh, um, 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 among custom international, we've clearly identified them as such. Um, we, we have different views about um, the relevance of general um, assembly resolutions, right? Um, so, so there are um, uh, at least some beginnings of engagement. And so in this fifth report, then um, uh, my, um, my, uh, my uh, attempt was to very much explain why, in my view, uh, these materials, um, 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 uh, mountains of materials, um, in fact, reflect practice as we have understood it, right? And so practice in a very broad sense of the word that we have understood. And I think it's also useful to, and obviously you can't do this in the commentary, I think it would be inappropriate to do this in the commentary, um, to, but I think it is also useful in this fifth report uh, to sort of compare the commission's previous work and say, look at this draft article that was generally accepted by states, um, you know, and look at what it's based on. A look at this draft conclusion, you know, that was adopted just three years ago, um, you know, in this other topic and look what it was based on. Uh, but, but I, I think that's also important. And so that's really my, um, um, so my approach to sort of the methodology question. I, I think it is important where, where it's possible uh, to reflect as much practice as we can. And in fact, the, 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 there were some states um, in their comments that um, have pointed out that have given, um, sort of said for this draft conclusion, you might want to look at A, B, C, D as practice and so on. So, so um, they will certainly be in the commentaries and I haven't started working on the commentaries yet. I'll start working on the commentaries actually next week. Um, they'll certainly be in the commentaries um, uh, at attempt at some places to include more practice. There are some places where because of the dynamics within the commission, I can't include more practice. So for example, I mean, to speak about draft conclusion 16 and, um, and um, the UN Security Council um, so decisions, uh, we haven't included a lot of practice there because the members of the commission that don't want the UN Security Council did not want the commentary to be bulky. And so, I, and in fact, if my memory serves me correctly, that was a compromise that we arrived at that the members of the commission who did not want to see UN Security Council will not insist on the dissenting voice in the commentary. What I gave back in, in response was that there would only be two sentences and one footnote, um, right? And so that's a compromise. I think that's a compromise that I have to respect. Um, um, so there, there is practice out there. And also, I mean, if people want practice, they can always go back to the reports on which this is based. So for example, for draft conclusion 16, um, it, would have been the third report. So even the materials used in the third report, uh, my third report, uh, did not find um, their way into um, so the commentaries, but they could still be used, right? So that's, I think, uh, a way to sort of um, um, so make that point. Um, so on draft conclusion three and draft conclusion two, in fact, the initial proposal in 2016 of a special rapporteur was a combined provision which has so which had a definition and um, uh, so which had a definition and um, and uh, uh, um, um, and then these general characteristics um, and obviously you know I mean I, me myself personally I wouldn't have any objections to that but I think it would create the same difficulties that it created before. So probably um, it's best not to try to combine them. Um, it's probably also best since since a lot of the criticism, of draft conclusion three is that it creates this impression that you are establishing new criteria. Um, it's perhaps also not wise to sort of further strengthen this by putting them in one draft conclusion. Um, the only thing I will say, um, or at least the only additional thing I will say though is, is um, you're right, and this is a point that I actually didn't mention, that there were some states um, that said, where's this coming from? It's not an article 53. You know, and that's true, it's not an Article 53, but our responsibility is not to rewrite Article 53. Uh, that's not our responsibility. Um, the fact is, you know, and again, um, uh, many have criticized non-reliance on practice. If you look at just about every judicial decision on use Kogans, you will find something about fundamental values or fundamental interests. So now you're saying we must ignore 
practice because Article 53 doesn't say anything about fundamental values, right? So there's always this. this, this. So I think it's important, and I think it's important to retain it. Um, uh, I, I mean, it might be important to clarify, uh, I think, that relationship between draft conclusion two and draft. So, yeah, so between draft conclusion three and draft conclusion four, clearly to make it clear that we're not creating new criteria, um, so, but that, that these are just general characteristics. We might even say something like these are really descriptive uh, or something like that. Um, I mean, I absolutely agree with you on um, your comment about treaty provisions um, and the extent to which treaty provisions uh, can can be a basis for use Kogans. In fact, the original um, proposal by the special rapporteur was exactly that. It was a lot more explicit, right? So it was divided into two into three parts. The first part was customary international law. The second part was on general principles of law. And the third part was on treaty law. And as far as treaty law is concerned, uh, my proposal was, well, a treaty can reflect a, a norm of general international law. And only to that extent would it be a basis. Um, needless to say, there are many members of the commission um, that feel very strongly that treaty provisions, um, in fact, they are the most important, they might even argue, right, um, um, basis for, for use Kogan. So again, um, so here you have one of those, those, those interesting things where um, the commission very much like the United Nations also um, works on compromise. And here we're able to arrive at a compromise which uses rather ambivalent language um, and then also treats general principles I mean, treaty rules the same because, I mean, there are many members of the commission that feel, no, that in fact, it's custom international law and general principles. And I would fall into that category. Um, uh, I know there isn't a lot of practice. And in fact, that's why the language that's used is tentative language because it suggests that there isn't practice, but it simply says you can't rule it out because after all, general principles of law are norms of general international law, right? And so from that perspective, then you shouldn't rule it out. I think the language that we've crafted now, um, even though it doesn't satisfy all, I think is appropriate in the sense that it, 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 it manages to put all of these things together. And then there's some clarifications um, in the commentary. If you read the commentary, um, in fact, the commentary is kind of am, am, ambiguous in a sense, because at places it makes it clear that treaty rules can form a basis for use Kogan's norms to the extent that they reflect um, rules of custom international law. And here there's a reference to, um, and here there's a reference to, um, to the North Sea continental shelf cases. Um, so on the international community of states, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's very interesting. The point that you, you make is absolutely right. And I just want to pull up a document um, uh, um, because I do respond, in fact, to, um, to the argument made concerning the North Sea continental shelf cases. So there's two responses that I give um, in the fifth report. The one response is the ICJ has used many different phrases and qualifiers, right? So again, it'll have to be uh, uh, important to sort of clearly identify why you're picking the North Sea continental shelf cases and um, so virtually uniform. But actually that's not even the most important reason why you shouldn't use that. Um, the reference to North Sea continental shelf cases virtually uniform is actually incorrect. And it shows again that, that, that these cases just simply aren't read. Um, in that case, the court is not using virtually uniform as a quantitative standard, right? Uh, the phrase virtually uniform there doesn't refer to quantity, how many states, but rather to quality, the type of practice. In other words, it's not how many states participated, but rather whether or not the practice of those states that did participate was uniform. Um, so here again, there's this conflation. There's a phrase that's used in the ICJ judgment. Now we must use it even though it's used in a completely different context, right? So, so I think um, we have to be careful that I think that the language in, in draft conclusion seven is just fine. Um, what we could do, of course, again, we can clarify in the commentary, um, this notion that what we're doing here is we are we're making a qualitative assessment and not a quantitative assessment, and it's based on many different factors and that numbers aren't the most important thing. Um, you're right, I am very much attached to draft conclusion 21. Um, and in fact, I'm attached to draft conclusion 21, interestingly, in part because of some of the things that you said about draft conclusion 16. It's precisely because with this particular topic, you cannot leave everything up to unilateral determination, right? 
Um, so because you cannot leave anything up to unilateral determination, it's important, even though it's difficult, and I'm not saying it's not difficult, I, I accept all the criticism, I see all the flaws, uh, but we still have to find a way to, to have a provision that sort of, I mean, you can never do away with, but that sort of at least takes away a little bit this possibility for um, unilateral invocation um, um, and so on. Uh, on draft conclusion 23, uh, what's the, um, so the added value? I mean, I, I think, so one, many states really want this list. Um, so that's one. Um, so, but secondly, it's, it's just simply to recognize what we have done in the past. I mean, um, the commission has in the past identified all of these norms and they're all found in different parts in different commentaries. To find them, you have to read the commentaries. Um, the commentaries to the articles on state responsibilities that uh, is this thick. Um, uh, we're just simply, this is a meant to be a user-friendly text, as I said at the beginning, right? Um, that even if you, you know, haven't read the articles on state responsibility, you're able to find things just like that. So that's that's the added value of article, sorry, uh, um, um, sort of the annex. It provides these norms and it gives examples of what we mean by norms of uh, of, of these Kogans. And I think it would be a, um, um, I'm sad if we didn't have it. I must say I'm not as as invested in inclusion 23 as I am in draft inclusion 21, uh, but I am pretty invested in, 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 uh, uh, in draft inclusion 23 as well, just not as strongly as I am in draft inclusion 21. If I may, and I think uh, Arman uh, Savarian has asked, requested the floor and perhaps I'll have him um, also uh, intervene. And anyone, please, uh, colleagues or friends, uh, if you'd like to ask questions to uh, Professor Kladi. If I may, on this issue of the dispute settlement procedures, I've been wondering uh, from the all, already from the draft articles of the 2001 draft articles, you know, in the big discussion where, where, where you have a text actually come emanating from the ILC, which is a set of articles or a set of conclusions like this one. What is really the need to put in procedural uh, um, dispositions like the dispute settlement one? Uh, and in this case, of course, we have the, the, Vien the Vienna Convention that, you know, has a, a similar uh, existing uh, uh, provision. Of course, not everyone is party there, but these are just draft conclusions. And that is one issue that, you know, perhaps uh, has been, you know, in my mind also uh, um, in regard to the discussion uh, in, you know, with the drafting of the articles on state responsibility. Uh, to, to just uh, add to this uh, very, these very interesting uh, comments. And the second comment, and then I'll really give the floor to whoever has asked it, then my, um, my colleagues will help me. Uh, Arman, I think, is first. But um, Diary 20, the, the non-exhaustive list. I see here, I mean, the ILC is saying that, you know, this is something, these are, you know, some examples that we have referred to in the past. And in reading your non-exhaustive list, I, I mean, these are examples that have been cited by the International Court of Justice in the past. So is it uh, in, in uh, a, you know, many cases from Barcelona Traction and on forward to more recent cases. So I'm wondering if it's the ILC or the ICJ or both. But let me immediately, um, I don't know if Armand is, Armand, had you requested the floor? It's good to see you. Please uh, uh, unmute. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I placed my question in the chat, and so I do not propose to recite it. But if I may uh, just add one short gloss to it, which is um, that it does seem seem to me personally that the the text, particularly thinking of its utility in the long term, could be. Uh, enhanced, improved uh, with a, a longer time frame, taking into account uh, the comments that have been, been made previously, um, including uh, by the chairman. And so um, if I recall correctly, please correct me, Professor Tladi, if I'm mistaken, the idea was to have a second reading and to conclude with the second reading. Um, but thinking of, for example, the Law of Treaties project and, and other projects of similar importance, uh, they have taken longer time frames with multiple special, special rapporteur. Um, and so I just wonder whether uh, you personally might be open to that idea. Thank you. Thanks, Arman, and good to see you. Um, 
I see also Mariana Gliatti, who perhaps wants to, so we'll take a few questions. Um, Mariana. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to both uh, speakers. It has been a very educational and um, valuable opportunity to, to get the insights of these uh, proceedings. Um, my question is for uh, Professor Tlavi. And I actually wanted to take you to a more specialized, more specific uh, topic. You mentioned uh, the, uh, the reference to state responsibility. And I was wondering if there is any specific reference in the draft conclusions on international organizations, whether it concerns their responsibility or more broadly and in general, uh, due to the limited practice there, we could use all the guidance that the commission can give us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, let me just take this opportunity to salute some members of the ILC who are following this uh, informal discussion, uh, Sir Michael Wood, uh, Patricia Galvao-Telish, good to see you. And one, uh, an, an incoming member in 23, Martin Svaparinsky, it's good to see you too. So uh, any other questions from the floor at this stage? My colleagues will help me if, you, if they see any questions on chat. Uh, Nicolas and uh, Akis, do we have anything, please? And then I'll again turn the floor to um, a diary. Uh, Nicolas, yeah. Thank you for giving me the floor. Um, we have no further questions in the chat box, but I would like to ask a question, if I may. Um, thank you very much, Professor Tladi, for your um, speech and your presentation. Um, I would like to push a bit further on conclusion number 21, since it has been so hotly debated and, uh, in fact, many states have raised, voiced their concerns. Um, so many states have suggested that this provision should be either dropped altogether or at least uh, recognized uh, in the commentaries that it is written in a non-prescriptive language. Um, now, given that, um, would you consider uh, softening up a bit the language of the uh, of the provision uh, to make it clear that you know we're not trying to impose any obligations here, but rather um, suggesting. Um, and also, I believe it was the United States in their comments uh, that suggested that the respective conclusions on customary law do not contain such a uh, respective provision. That has to do with uh, procedural requirements. Um, so why should we introduce such um, a provision here? So uh, I, I, what I read behind this is that there is an issue with the rationale, so the justification of the um, uh, provision. So I would invite you to give us, um, you know, the, the, the what is different between use codings and customer land. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, uh, Nicolas. So then uh, I'll turn the floor to you again, uh, Diary, and perhaps we will then uh, wrap up. Um, thank you very much. So all very interesting <laughs> questions. Um, I'll start with, um, in fact, I'll take uh, your question, Faye, with uh, Nicolas's question uh, on draft conclusion 21. I mean, I think that, that, um, that you're correct that it's not normal to have um, to have a provision like this um, in a text like the draft conclusions. Um, in fact, I can't remember in which in which topic last year I op I opposed. Um, oh yes, it was in the immunity text. I opposed a um, the me personally. I opposed the inclusion of a dispute settlement provision precisely because I didn't think it fits. I can see all of those arguments. Um, the reason why I think it's important here is because of the far-reaching consequences of use Corgans. Uh, um, and and um, this idea of you, I mean, sort of so unilateral invocation I and mean, auto-interpretation is a problem that applies throughout um, um, so throughout international law. And yet with respect to use Corgans, because of its particular character, because of its particular nature, uh, because of the sensitivities, I think it's important to do everything that we can do to sort of minimize, um, if we can, um, unilateral invocation um, uh, and uh, um, an auto-interpretation. If you think about some of the things that Maria Telalian was saying about 
uh, about um, uh, risks to, for example, UN Security Council, um, so, um, so decisions. This is what the potential to disrupt, you know, as some have said, um, international relations and so on, I think makes it imperative that there is a provision like this. Now, Nicholas, um, is there a way that we could soften it? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think my intention had always been that it should be soft, um, you know, and to the extent that it's not clear that it's soft, that it doesn't look soft enough, um, I have made in this fifth report uh, proposals to soften it up. So one of the things, for example, is just to change the title, right? The title says procedural requirements. The word requirements you know, almost has this very strong thing that suggests that you're saying it's required. So, um, so, so that's changed. Um, and then to include a, a number of more provisions. Um, so one or two other provisions that make it clear that this is not binding in the text. And then also in the commentary to, you know, stress again, over and over and over again, that it's not binding. Uh, and then maybe also, and this was um, a suggestion that was made, I hope you won't mind, because I heard you said he was here. Um, um, and was a suggestion that was made to me by Michael Wood, um, that we just change the placement, because at the moment, it's um, where it's placed, you know, it's a consequence, right? So that almost suggests that it's a right. So, so those kinds of things have been proposed to sort of try to soften it up a little bit. Um, I mean, I know that there, there are some other members of the commission that are also thinking about ways to soften it, who haven't who haven't yet shared with me their views. And of course, all of those will be accepted and I'm sure we'll find ways to accept it. I think it would be, I think it will be dangerous not to have it, um, uh, you know, some provision in some form or the other. Um, um, so on the list and um, so whether it's ICJ, ILC, actually I was thinking about this this morning. I mean, I think it is ILC because the list it's, it's um, you know, and part of it is because of, how the current configuration of the ILC is. Um, you know, if you were to say it's the ICJ and then you said Barcelona Traction, the immediate response would be, ha, the ICJ didn't in Barcelona Traction say, say these were, uh, um, so norms of use code, and they said these were got ominous obligations. So that'd be those. Um, whereas the ILC has explicitly said use Kogan's these norms. And so that's why it's, it's, um, it's, uh, I mean, it's safer to say to um, um, so the ILC. We could have said, norms that the ICJ has identified and then we identify only those norms. I mean, that is something we could have done um, 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 so as well, but but I think we went for the ILC largely because it's our own. So I think we are, yeah, um, I mean, it's our own work and I think it's acceptable then for us to sort of say, this is what we have said in the past, uh, you know, our norms of use Corgans. Um, uh, so, uh, so Armana, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I hear you about um, you know taking time, but but is a real? I mean, so one is is um, there's a big dif a big difference I think between uh, a topic like this and uh, a big project like the Vienna Convention that that essentially is codifying a whole area of law, right? It's not it's not codifying one particular rule, if you like, it's a whole area of law, it's a whole branch of international law, if you like. Um, um, so I think that there's a big difference. Um, two, I think that um, for what we're trying to do, again, recall um, uh, the question that was asked by Professor Silianos about the, the value add, and I said the value add is is to assist those uh, who may be called upon to interpret use Kogans who are not skilled. It's not necessary then to sort of do a voluminous, uh, you know, it's um, uh, um, 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 it's a project that lasts for 50 years. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I guess the ILC could decide that. I mean, I certainly will not be be proposing that. I'll certainly be opposing that, in fact. Uh, you know, but the, it's not inconceivable that the ILC could say, yeah, you know, sort of we're going to continue um, um, and do this next year. I'm not sure if there's a real value to that. Um, uh, I'm not sure if there's a real value. All that it means is that you have a new group of people next year who will have, uh, uh, who will have, um, who will have a uh, um, a crack at it, and I'm sure they'll they'll rewind and they'll reconfigure certain things. Maybe they'll strengthen draft conclusion three. Maybe they'll take it out all completely. I mean, I, you know, I I I think that's the only thing that's going to happen is that with the new quinquennium, you're going to have um, uh, so people doing um, um, so new things, a new perspective, and it might be a completely different text. And so it might not be as you're suggesting building up. It just might be starting from scratch. 
And then maybe in the next quinquennium after that, you know, there's a, 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 so it could be, I mean, I won't support that, but it could be, a, 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 it's not my choice. Um, um, so whether or not there's a, um, um, so the commission uh, decides to continue. What I will say is what I, I have said in the past, and this is actually specifically with respect to DAF conclusion um, 23, is that there is a possibility for, for the commission to, in the future, do a lot of these topics and in that way contribute further to use Kogan's. And so by sort of saying, um, you know, let's look at, I don't know, I mean, um, I'm, I'm just, so let's say, um, so look at self-determination, for example. Um, and then there you, you, if you do an analysis of self-determination and you come to the conclusion that it is used organs or not, um, um, you, you know, and then you identify some of the consequences. And so there again, you build up. That's more of a building up thing, I think, than, than, than having a, a new commission um, deciding to do it. I mean, then Mariana, your question is a, is a really important question. Um, um, it's, it's a question that's come up actually in the, um, in the context of particular draft conclusions, but also generally about the extent to which we reflect international organizations. Um, there are many ways in which this is relevant. So in the articles on state, sorry, um, so in the provisions relating to state responsibility, uh, so, but also in respect of, um, uh, sort of the consequences, um, um, and so on. There, there, there were some states that have made suggestions um, that the role and the relevance of international organizations has to be more clearly reflected, if not in the text, then in the commentaries. Um, and I can't, I, I have to be honest, I can't remember if I made any proposals about the text, but there will certainly be, be some suggestions uh, for clearer explanations um, of uh, the role of international organizations in the commentaries. Thank you. I see Sir Michael Wood has raised his hand and perhaps he would like to intervene. Well, very quickly. Um, firstly, to say that I agree with uh, almost everything that Dere has said today. Um, I particularly believe that the commission will complete the work this year and that it's right that it does so. Um, the idea of going on with a new special rapporteur, a new commission, which would have more than 50% of the members will be new. Um, of course, it could lead to a different result, but I don't think it would necessarily be a better result because I believe that with the first reading text, we are almost there and that what's needed will be refinements, especially uh, to the commentaries, as Deary has said, and, and I look forward to completing the work. I just wanted to say one word about um, Conclusion 21, the, the dispute settlement, if you call it that, uh, provision. Uh, I do think I agree with Deary that it's very important in this particular context to have that provision. And if you reflect on what happened at the Vienna Conference on the Law of Treaties, which nearly broke up and fell apart because of the problem that quite a number of states had with the Jus Kogan's provisions without the safeguard of the dispute settlement provision. It was absolutely critical. And the eventual compromise, which was put forward by a, a group of uh, states from Africa and elsewhere that, that saved the conference. And, and I think in this context, it's equally important for the same reasons to have a dispute settlement provision. What it is, of course, is another matter and, uh, and we'll come back to that. But thank you very much. This was a really very good uh, um, session. It makes me wish that I was a Greek international lawyer based in, based in Athens or somewhere, because you, if you can organize such a good group and, and such a good meeting, it's very good and thank you for for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Sir Michael. See, this uh, Zoom era allows us to actually, uh, for us to feel that perhaps we're in the UK or in South Africa, and then for you to feel like you're in Greece. I'd uh, happily trade. Uh, I've been in isolation for a long while. So, um, a diary, I don't see any other uh, comments. Uh, I don't know if you would like to uh, conclude or Maria, if you would just like to, if you have any uh, closing uh, comments before I just, I end the session, we've already <laughs> gone over time. 
but uh, I think you received some responses, <laughs> Mr. Lelia. <Lenya. laughs> yes, I received a lot of responses and I thank very much uh, uh, Jerry for uh, his very, very comprehensive uh, report of today. And of course, uh, I took note of the comments he made about uh, my suggestion uh, regarding article, uh, I mean, conclusion 7.2. And in particular, the comments I share, uh, the comments he made about the North Continental Shelf case. And maybe these uh, explanations could be further elaborated in the commentaries to this uh, uh, conclusion. And thank you very much for all the explanations given. I wish you all the best. And um, as uh, Michael Wood said earlier, uh, we should be optimistic that uh, this set of uh, conclusions will be adapted uh, by this commission uh, the soonest. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're coming to the end of the session. We've actually um, gone a bit over, but it was quite uh, stimulating. I do want to thank um, Professor Tladi for, for joining us. Uh, I know that Zoom can be tiring. I'm, we're very grateful to him for just reaching out to this part of the world as well. And I'm, I just am very happy to have seen uh, um, so many friends from uh, all over, um, mostly Europe, but uh, Africa as well, uh, in this first discussion group. We will be continuing, stay tuned. Uh, I want to thank our, my co-conveners, uh, Dr. Nicolas Vulgaris and Dr. Thymius Papastavridis, who will be doing the work and organization of this, and uh, Dimitris Panousos who's doing all the technicalities, which we have no idea about. Uh, we hope to see you soon. Save the date, February 9. It's a surprise. We won't tell you what's happening, but it will be our next session. You will be uh, informed um, uh, very soon. Uh, thank you to all. Have a good year wherever you are. Stay healthy. Thank you very much, Jerry. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.